A mere 30 years ago, video games were just black and white dots bouncing back and forth on a television screen, and in those days it was a technological marvel. But in today's world, and with a bit of practice, you can create something better than this in a day or two. Over the years, technology has grown drastically, video games are becoming more mainstream and are a part of our lives. They earn millions a day because they play out more like a movie than just a plumber smashing blocks. But how does someone take an idea and turn it into a multi-million dollar franchise like these? Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. These students are learning how a video game is created. At the moment they are learning the basics of drawing concept art for the game they are making to help them pass their course. But unfortunately, they've got a long way to go. Video games have become a huge part of our culture and it's hard for us to ignore their existence. Every week new games are released and millions are made from this industry. The process is a long and frustrating one, but the end result could be something of a marvel. A game of beauty or something you can't help but keep your mouth open while you play. There are many developers out there. Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, Sega, Naughty Dog. There are literally hundreds of developers. Sega started life as Surface Games, a corn-operated games manufacturer in 1940. Nintendo began in 1889 and hand-produced Hadafuda cards. But how did Valve begin from separating from Microsoft? Well, like a lot of people in the industry, I got uh, support and encouragement from people who are already in the field. Um, Mike Harrington and I were both at uh, Microsoft. And we both played a ton of games. Um, one of the th one of the responsibilities I had was for Windows, and I sort of got aggravated when people would talk about why. Uh, video games could never be developed on an on a on an operating system. Uh, that you'd need direct control over uh, sound cards at the register level or or something like that. The arguments were were bad arguments. Um, they were not technically sophisticated arguments about what what the problems were. So I decided that I would look around and find the most demanding game and work with those developers to get it running on Windows. That that would be an existence proof that Windows was a viable platform for video games. Uh, a year or two later, when I was thinking about what interesting opportunities might be out there, uh, Abrash was talking to Mike Harrington and I and encouraged us very strongly to come out to id to see this new game engine they were developing, which was the Quake engine. So Mike and I went out and uh, John Carmack essentially walked up to us and handed us the source code to the Quake engine on a bunch of floppies and said, Mike says you're going to do something interesting with this. So I trust Mike. So let's see what you guys can do. And Mike and I got on a plane and said, oh, I guess we're starting a video game company. To start with, a group within the company forms what's called a core team, a group that discusses the concept of the game. They will discuss what the game will be about, how it will look, and how it will play. While already having the basic outline of the story and or a few chapters written out. Next they will create a timeline for the development cycle. And here is an example of how it will plan out. But no matter how well you plan out, it doesn't always go according to plan. Duke Nukem Forever, scheduled to release on May 3rd after 12 years of development and numerous delays, has been delayed. The infamous sequel to Duke Nukem 3D went through several different development companies due to poor planning and financial difficulties. It released to mediocre reviews where people said the game fell flat with its outdated gameplay and visuals, and the anticipation for this game would have made it almost impossible to meet expectations. Going back to this production schedule that some students made, we can see they have thought about when they want the animation to be done by, 
we can see when they want an alpha build to be released and when they plan to make all the bugs fix, as well as which department will be in charge of each thing. But Valve tends to do things a little bit differently. Uh, there are about 300 people at the company. Uh, we don't really have departments. Um, we have an unusual organization where uh, each person sort of responsible for managing themselves. So uh, people figure out what it is that they should be working on and that's actually their first and primary job is to figure out how they can create the most value for customers. So we don't really have a testing department or a programming department or an art department. I tend to be something of a utility infielder in baseball terminology. I tend to bounce around a lot. I do a bunch of things uh, poorly. Uh, so I jump in usually when there's a hole, when we're trying to figure out something new or there's some reason that uh, somebody who's not better at it hasn't already stepped in and started working on it. So that means that my day-to-day -day activities are a little more interrupt driven than most people. Um, a lot of people try to focus on structuring their day so they're most productive. For a, an artist or a, a programmer, uh, they have different kinds of rhythms to when they're being very productive. It's very bad to interrupt a programmer. If a programmer can't go for an hour or two without being distracted, they're going to be a lot less productive than if they're interrupted every five minutes. Uh, some people will structure their work so they get a bunch of sort of interrupt driven stuff out of the way and then they'll actually just work from home for a couple of days in a row uh, if their home environment you know allows them to be very focused and undistracted. So each person, you know, each discipline has its own constraints and prerequisites uh, and each person figures out on their own what what works best uh, for them. I tend to be very interrupt driven and jump around a lot. So I'm, I'm easily distracted. The engine of the game is then built and this will include the coding for the physics of the environment, how the lighting will work and how the character will react to certain actions within the game. It works a bit like a calculator for a scientific experiment. Imagine you are playing a game of marbles. When you flick a marble, the engine will calculate the speed, the angle and the weight of the ball to calculate a situation before it reaches its destination to give you a pretty awesome result on screen. While that is going on, the story continues to be written, constantly expanding the universe, character development and even plot twists that will even make the most dedicated fans question their own existence. Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Sit. Would you kindly? But what do the writers have to consider when they're writing a script? The, I'm going to use Left 4 Dead 2 as an, one example. So for that, um, the artists go off and make some art of characters they're thinking about. So we first have a location chosen, right? We know it's going to start in Savannah. We know not everybody needs to come from there, but they have to have a reason to be there. So they'll come off with some art and then I'll, or we'll all come with some writing then for ideas we have. And then for example, for that game, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but like Nick um, originally came from the art. Uh, that was a slam dunk there. Uh, Coach came from uh, the writers and the others came from a mix. It just kind of kept going back and forth. And, uh, you know, for instance, in Portal, if you take uh, Wheatley, who's this little uh, sphere, that really came from the fact that uh, in Portal 1, we had introduced these spheres, and they were they were sort of characters, but not really. They were really designed around the gameplay that was going to be required, that you had to pick them up and then kind of throw them into a, a container. And we knew going into Portal 2 that Wheatley would probably be some version of this these spheres, so his general form was sort of dictated by the gameplay requirements of Portal 1. Although if you look at the Portal 1 spheres and the Portal 2 spheres, once we decided to make him a full-fledged character, it's actually, it's a lot more articulated and, and more complicated in, in Portal 2. So how did you join Valve? Were you brought on for your previous work or did you just send in your CV like everyone else? And do you have any qualifications in writing? 
Um, really, uh, we had run a website called oldmanmurray.com uh, that the guys at Valve were fans of. Um, and we had started some uh, back and forth with them back in the day. In fact, they made a special version of uh, TF Classic uh, for us uh, to play against them, um, which is kind of unfair because it hadn't been released yet. And uh, they were really good at it and we weren't. Uh, but it had some special in gags for us. Um, but that was a bunch of years went by. Yeah. And, you know, we were doing our own thing. And then we just one day and I don't know, seven years ago, just got check, mail from Gabe. Yeah, check the spam folder. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, if we, I mean, it was literally, I don't even know if you still check that account, yeah. but that was in the final days of me even checking that old man Murray account. Um, and it was just said, do you want to come down and... Uh, no, no, do you want to work at Valve? Yeah, do you want to work at Valve? Sure, can you say anything more? No, just come down. Yeah, so they flew us down and they give it, gave us kind of an interview Hanging slash out. meet and greet. Yeah, and then within about four weeks, we started we started yeah um but so neither of us has a uh, has a uh like an academic background in writing mm -hmm. chet's probably the closest the degree in theater yeah theater degree uh uh we were both actually come from a uh engineering background video games can take anything from a few weeks to six years to make because it's not just the characters or the engine or the story that has to be developed but objects within the game itself Half the time the objects aren't created automatically, but created individually, and that takes time. To give you an example, I'm just going to draw a simple object, and in this case, a TV screen. There you go, television screen. That took roughly about three minutes to make. And in this case, it was a very simple object, but unfortunately, games aren't always that easy to make. They take a lot of um, time, they take a lot of practice, and I haven't even started on texturing, I haven't started on adding materials. So relatively, this project could have took me about 10 minutes to make a simple object like this. Once scripting is completed, they will begin casting voice actors to play the roles of their characters in the game. And today, I was lucky enough to be invited by the students to do a little recording session for them. <laughs> so, you have come to stop me, the immortal. <laughs> you, your father, and your ancestors Wait, have all There's something wrong with the mic. Is there? I hear some popping. Yeah, you. I hear some popping. Okay. I'll just adjust it to make it sound a bit better. Okay. Try it now. T Test one, Yeah, two. it sounds much better. Okay, Test. start from the top, right? Okay. Okay. I'll yeah. count down. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have come. So, how was it? <laughs> it actually went all right. It was a lot harder than I thought it would be. But, yeah. <laughs> Game characters are now created using a program called My developed by Autodesk. It's the same program I used to create the TV from before. In the last generation of game consoles, characters and scenery had to be created twice, both in low resolution for gameplay and high resolution for CGI cutscenes. But with today's technology, we only need to create assets once and they can be used for both the gameplay and cutscenes. They will then lip sync the voices to the mouse, either by motion capture or by selecting individual lip flaps for each word. Now they will begin putting together everything ready for playtesters to find any bugs and glitches. Some testers will be given a script to follow, some will play the game freely, while others are just there for developers to monitor their enjoyment and frustration of the game. Now all that's left to do is to market and package the game, but it's still not over as there is still one thing left to do combating piracy. It is said millions is lost each month and billions is lost yearly. Companies are beginning to employ strict DRMs, digital rights management and online passes which unlocks content on the disc that can only be used once. But if it wasn't for the used game market I would have never got into the Assassin's Creed or Elder Scrolls franchise. So is DRMs doing more harm than it is good? 
I think there are some fairly ill-conceived ideas about why piracy occurs. Um, I think a lot of people in the gaming industry perceive piracy as being a pricing issue. So if I'm a customer and I can get something for free, I'll steal it and not pay the content creator. That is not, in fact, what we see going on. Uh, we almost always see it as being a service issue, and it doesn't take a great deal of service to make piracy uh, sort of a non-issue. So, for example, when we entered the Russian market, we were told, you know, why are you entering the Russian market? There's, it's everybody pirates everything. It's going to be impossible um, to make any money. And what we found is simply releasing the product at the same time you release it in other regions of the world and doing a good job localizing it into Russian, just doing two simple things like that uh, meant that Russia went from being sort of a, a non-existent market for us to the point now where Russia is starting to be our, is about to become the number one territory we have uh, in Europe. So it's catching up to, to Germany. So that's an example of what we see where if you think of piracy in the used game business as purely about um, how customers can get your product for the lowest price, you're missing the fact that your typical customer actually wants a lot more uh, than they're able to get out of a traditional retail product. So, you know, uh, if you open the door to people getting more value from you as a content creator and start thinking about how to create that value, uh, you end up uh, being much more profitable in the long run. It's a message we communicate over and over again inside of the gaming world where we can show people like one of the things we do a lot now is we track when various third-party DRM capabilities are hacked and point out that there's no difference in the sales of the product before and after you know we can do that with Steam and say you know what we really think was happening is the presence of DRM actually was depressing your sales all along rather than preventing uh, uh, a sudden drop in sales as people realized uh, that they could get it for free. So the fact that sales don't change when DRM is hacked is yet another piece of data that we use to educate people in the gaming space. We also try to talk to other uh, media developers uh, to think about how to increase the, the service component of what they do. You know, for example, with uh, movie makers, uh, how to stop thinking of their product as this fairly static and dead collection of bits and instead try to think of it as a community building uh, tool or uh, an opportunity for uh, incremental and ongoing service to customers. I mean, I'd be, I'd be incredibly grateful to a movie company that helped me deliver content on, the, on all of the devices that I have because that's a real problem I have. How do I get all of the all of the movies I like to watch on this, on all of the devices. And instead, they sort of automatically assume that if I'm trying to get it on a device, I must be trying to pirate it. And so they do their best to prevent it, which is going in exactly the wrong direction. It's like, I want, I'm a customer. I like content. Why are you making me wonder if I'll ever be able to watch this on my phone or my tablet? Uh, why are you making me manually replicate it from one PC to another PC? So I think if once they sort of get over that conceptual hump, hopefully we'll see mediums outside of video games starting to move in this direction as well. Well, the journey's been a long and stressful one, but it's worth it for the entertainment we get out of it. I've been Jamie Carty, and now if you excuse me, I've got some noobs I need to kill. Noob killer 91 back online, guys. My favorite video game is Forza 3. Minecraft. My favourite game is Dead Space. Uh, my favourite video game at the moment would probably be Tiny Wings, surprisingly. Uh, my favourite video game series is Uncharted. I like the Portal series. Because cause it's really fun, you can just play it for hours on end and do loads of random stuff in it. It never gets boring. Because of the graphics and the realism of uh, the game. The reason I would say that's my favourite video game at the moment is because like it, it's so simple and like just easy to use and you don't feel like you have to be playing it for hours because you probably just couldn't do that. The reason why I like Portal 2 is the gameplay, the characters, the story, just 
all around everything about it is fun. The reason why I like Uncharted is because, you know, the story, the level design, you know, how, like, finding different treasures and overall, it's um, humour.